Where you should be right now is done reading chapters 1 and 2 of The Cloven Viscount by Atalo Covino. If you've read chapter 1 and chapter 2, you already realize this is kind of a strange book, and the things that happen in it, of course, aren't realistic. The genre that I need you to remember is that this work is a work of fantasy. Um, at the beginning of chapter 3, and I'd like you to be looking at it with me, the narrator says, when my uncle made his return to Taralba, I was seven or eight years old. That first sentence actually tells us a lot. It tells us that the narrator is remembering something from when he was a child. And the narrator is, of course, now an adult. Later on, he's going to tell us that um, well, he does tell us that the Cloven Viscount is his uncle. They have the Viscount's father, whose name is Iolfo, is the narrator's grandfather. Um, they're relatives, and that's why the narrator lives at this castle where the Viscount lives. So, as this chapter begins, I want you to notice several things as you're reading it. One, I want you to notice the birds. There are several. There were in the first chapter, too. Remember the storks? The birds in this book are very symbolic. But I also want you to notice a few other things that are important. One thing I want you to remember is that this book, it's an allegory. That means it has symbolic meanings, and there are symbols in it. And the meaning of the book comes a lot from the symbols. Besides allegory, I need you to remember that the book is didactic. That means it's trying to teach you something. And this book is really trying to teach you something about human nature. You see, some people believe that people on the inside are partly good and partly bad. We have a divided self. Now, it's not always 50-50. Hopefully, it's almost never 50-50. Hopefully, most of us are more good than bad. But the idea in literature sometimes is that if you cut somebody in half, like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, who are really both the same person, then you get a good half and a bad half. In the Cloven Viscount, the Viscount who comes home in the ship, that's the evil half. And you should start noticing some subtle clues that he's the evil half. For example, he tries to give poisonous mushrooms to the narrator. Only an evil person would give a seven-year-old kid poisonous mushrooms to eat. He does other things that are evil, too. Like when he passes judgment on the criminals. He's going to hang all of them. He has no mercy. He has no clemency. He only has evil in his heart and he likes to destroy things. You'll notice that he goes around and he cuts things in two. It's a way of, I don't know, symbolic vengeance, I guess. The other thing that I really want you to notice is the imagery. That's part of what makes this fantasy book so amazing. The images of, you know, the Viscount wearing his black coat, cloak, and, you know, the wind blows, and you can see that he's only half a man. But it's, it's kind of spooky, and it's kind of scary. And that's just how this story is going to be told. Okay, what I want you to do is go read Chapter 3 right now and pause this video. And when you're done, hit unpause, and I'll tell you a few other things about Chapter 3. So hit pause right. It turns out in Chapter 3 that old Iolfo had trained one of his birds to fly up and check in on his son. At one point, the bird has done that, but then you get this image. It says this, and it's from the point of view of Ialfo. A little later, a little later, he heard the thud of something flung against the window. He leaned out, there on the pediment, that's the ledge outside the window, was the shrike, the bird, dead. The old man took it up in, a, in the palms of his hands and saw that the wing was broken off 
as if someone had tried to tear it. A claw was wrenched off, as if by two fingers, and an eye gouged out. The old man held the shrike tight to his breast and began to sob. Um, as he's holding this bird, he's, you know, obviously somebody tried to tear the bird in half. They took out an eye and a wing and a leg. Um, and it's almost as if Merdardo, the Viscount, had tried to kill half of the bird. How horrific. And why would anybody do that, except for the, the truth, which is they're evil? It says about Ialfo, and this is the end of chapter 3, That same day he took to his bed, and attendants on the other side of the cage saw that he was very ill. But no one could go and take care of him, as he had locked himself inside and hidden the keys. Birds flew around his bed. Since he had taken to it, they had all refused to settle or stop fluttering their wings. The next morning, when the nurse put her head into the bird cage, the aviary, she realized that the v Viscount Iolfo was dead. The birds had all perched on his on his bed, as if it were floating tree trunk in the midst of the sea. It's sad that the old man is dead, but what do the birds symbolically mean? That's something that you should be thinking about as you read on. On the beginning of chapter 4, it's going to say um, that Merdardo begins leaving the castle. Well, the question is, where is he going? He's actually easy to follow, and as you read, you'll notice that what they do is they, wherever he goes, he just cuts things in half, whether it's frogs or pears or mushrooms or whatever it is that he passes. As you're reading chapter 4, I want you to notice a few things. One, I want you to notice that a lot of what you're reading is symbolic. For example, mushrooms. Well, some mushrooms are poisonous and awful and will kill you, and some mushrooms are delicious and good for you. The mushrooms are just a symbol for people. People are the same way. Some are good and some are evil. And that's really the great theme of this book. What is a man? When you cut a man in half, symbolically, you get an evil half and a good half. Mushrooms, they are a good symbol of that because some are good for us and some are evil. The other thing that I want you to look at is, um, you know, anytime you use water, sometimes you can do this thing like with mirrors. In books like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, you have this divided self. So mirrors can make one thing that's a half look like a whole thing, or, or reflections in water do this too. They remind us that there is, you know, sort of like an image and then an opposite image to things. I want you to look for that as you read chapter four also. But really try and piece out things about the narrator. Okay. I'm going to leave you alone and let you read chapter four. So we're all going to pause the video right now and then come back. In the end of chapter four, the nurse says something to the narrator that I think is important. The narrator tells the nurse that the Viscount had tried to give him poisonous mushrooms. And it says, Sebastiana, the nurse, when I told her the story, said, The bad half of Merdardo has returned. Now I wonder about this trial today. They've caught this band of robbers, but they're not horrible, awful, terrible people. It says this, That day there was to be a trial of a band of brigands, arrested the day before by the castle constant constabulary. The brigands were from our estates. You know, it's their friends, local people. Uh, it was for the Viscount to judge them. The trial was held, and Mardardo sat sideways on his chair, chewing a fingernail. It's a symbol that he doesn't really care about this. 
Um, the brigands appeared in chains. The head of the band was a youth called Fior Fierro, who had been the first to notice the Viscount's litter while pounding grapes. He's just a kid. We recognize him from before. The injured parties appeared. They were a group of Tuscan knights who were passing through our woods on the way to the province when they had been attacked and robbed by Fior Fierro and his band. Fior Fierro defended himself, saying that those knights had come poaching on our land, and he had stopped and disarmed them um, as poachers, since the constabulary had done nothing about them. It should be said that at the time, assaults by brigands were very common, and the laws were very clement, which means it's not a serious crime. Also, our parts were particularly suitable for brigandage so that even some members of our family, especially in these turbulent times, would join a brigand band, and as for smuggling, it was about the lightest crime imaginable. In other words, what these men did was not really a very big deal. They took some stuff from each other. Petty theft. But Sebastiana's apprehensions were well-founded. Medardo condemned Forfiero and his whole band to die by hanging as criminals guilty of armed rapine. But since those robbed were guilty of poaching, he condemned them to die on the gilded too. In other words, he's not just killing the criminals, he's killing the people who accuse them of being criminals too. He's killing everybody for very light crimes. And to punish the constables who had appeared too late and not prevented either brigands or poachers from misbehaving, he decreed death by hanging for them too. That's 20 people. He's murdering 20 people. There were about 20 altogether. This cruel sentence produced consternation in us all. Not so much for the Tuscan gentry, whom no one had seen until then, as for the brigands and the constables who were generally well-liked. Master Petruchiado, this is a new character, he's the carpenter. He's the pack saddle and the carpenter. He was given a job of making the gibbet. The gibbet is a scaffold. It's, a, it's a, almost like a stage where you hang people. He was the most conscientious worker who took great pains in, in, in all he did. With great sorrow, for two of the condemned were his relations, he built a gibbet, ramificating like a tree, whose nooses all rose together and were maneuvered by a single winch. In other words, one person can pull one switch and kill everybody. It was such a big and ingenious machine that it could have uh, hanged simultaneously even more people than those now condemned. The Viscount took advantage of this to hang ten cats, alternating with every two criminals. So he's killing twenty men and ten cats. Why even kill cats? Well, there's no reason, except he's evil. And at first, no one had the heart to look at them. But soon people noticed what a really imposing sight they were. And our own judgments and opinions began to vary so that we were even sorry when it was decided to take them down and dismantle the big machine. How horrific. Okay, before you go on to chapter 5, I need to tell you a story. Some of you will have watched a cartoon movie called Brave, and I forget the name of the main character, but it's a girl with red hair, and at one point in the movie, She's trapped out in the woods, and she sees these little blue flames. They show up, and they disappear. They show up, and they disappear. Now, that's a real thing. At least I think so. It's a debatable point, but I've seen it. These little blue flames that show up, those are called will-o'-the-wisp. And I haven't seen them since I was a little boy but will-o'-the-wisp are a little tiny thing. They're a light blue light flame that shows up for just an instant, and then it'll show up somewhere else. 
You need to know what those are before you read chapter five. All right. Have a good Easter weekend. Take care of yourselves and your family, and I'll see you back here after the break.